Hey everyone, welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast. I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman and it is May 22nd, 2015, and I believe this is episode 30. Hi. <laughs> I have, uh, I've been gone for a month and I'm not going to spend a lot of time apologizing for why I've been gone, but that is kind of going to be in an indirect way, sort of the topic for today. Uh, I think I'm going to call this show Knitting Knit On Through All Crises, <laughs> which might be a bit of an exaggeration. Don't worry, everything's okay. But it's just, it's been, it's been an interesting month. It's been an interesting couple of months, actually. It all just kind of uh, narrowed in on, or, you know, backed me into a corner. And uh, so I just want to say a little bit about uh, how... I think what I want to talk about today is how um, how those times that are difficult affect our knitting life, and I don't want to be, well, I'll keep things fairly lighthearted, but I think it's just, it's an interesting topic. Um, I'm going to warn you, this is going to be something of a scatterbrained show. I have... Uh, tried to record this several times and have been putting it off and putting it off and I've just been feeling a little overwhelmed and I think I have been psyching myself out. Um, I tend to have a pretty, not scripted show, but a pretty outlined one. It takes a lot of time to put all of those thoughts together and I just can't seem to bring myself to do it. So I am just going to improv today and we will see how it goes. Um, so a few announcement type things before we get started, and hopefully I will actually remember them all. One of them is that I was contacted by uh, Lisa, who is Life Full of Laugh on Ravelry, and she asked me to let you know that she has a mini skein swap going on right now. Um, I will provide a link in the show notes to the group where she's doing the mini skein swap. It's actually, uh, sorry, a Facebook group. And, um, and I think the basic idea is that you gather up scraps of fingering weight yarn and trade for knitting blankets or whatever it is you want to make with your mini skeins. So I will uh, provide a link for that. I also need to let you know the winner of the drawing from last time. If you'll remember, I talked about Ambo O'Brien's collection um, beautiful collection of uh, lace pieces that all have heart shapes in them. And the winner of that is Wombat Knitter, who is, let's see what it tells me, Patty from Atlanta, Georgia. So congratulations. And uh, she said she would knit Dark Valentine because it looks airy and sophisticated, which, yeah, I totally agree. Lovely collection. And if you didn't win it, I hope you will go take a look at it anyway, because it's gorgeous. And Amba actually developed the lace pattern just, she wrote it herself. A lot of people use stitch patterns out of stitch, stitch dictionaries, and this is one that she made up herself. So it's, um, you know, just that much more unusual because the pieces are that much more unique because of that. So there's that. And I also wanted to tell you that there is a really fun event going on right now that if you are a fan of podcasts, you may have heard something about already. And that is the Pal Cal going on at the Actually Knitting podcast. Uh, the host is Michelle, and she has a summer long knit along going on where the, the basic rule is that you knit or crochet things that are designed by your favorite podcasters. So they can be either patterns by podcasters, yarns, uh, you can put them in project bags by podcasters, uh, use stitch markers by podcasters, you know, whatever tools and, uh, and instructions you want to use, as long as they have something to do with a podcaster, that's basically the idea. There are other rules, and I will give you a link to the, the group where, or the group thread where she uh, talks about all of this and is getting things started. Uh, the the knit along has, I believe, begun. Let me just, oh no, it hasn't actually. Cast on is June 1st and you need to be finished by September 1st and you can enter as many projects as you like. I uh, actually have a, um, 
what do you call it? Coupon code. <laughs> coupon code. I have a coupon code available for people who are doing the Pal Cal. And I'll just go ahead and tell you because, you know, I like you. Let me double check that I am actually giving you the right coupon code. Uh, the coupon code is PALCAL15, P-A-L-K-A-L-1-5, and it gives you 20% off of any and all of my self-published patterns. So again, I'll give you a link for that. But basically, anything that I've put out myself instead of doing through a magazine or a website or something like that. So, uh, yeah, and a bunch of people, if you watch the, I think it's episode, what episode is it? Ah! It, oh, it is episode 30? It's, it's one of the, it's the episode that is closest to May 2nd. Um, for actually knitting, she describes a lot of the discounts and special deals that podcasters are offering and talks about what the structure of the thing is. So that is very cool. What I am wearing is the one thing I have been knitting that uh, I can show you. We are in high, high design knitting time right now. <laughs> I am working on a collection. So there will be many things that I cannot show you at the moment, unfortunately, but this is my Yauza shawl. This is actually the Ka'ana shawlettes. It's K-A apostrophe A-N-A. -A. And uh, it is designed by Jennifer Weissman. And it has a really cool, I haven't blocked this yet, but I don't think it's really going to need much blocking since this is a pretty thick shawl. This isn't going to show up very well on camera, and honestly, it's not the stitch definition, obviously, on a variegated yarn is not all that sharp, but there's a really nice leaf lace pattern that goes along the edge, and the rest is a, a garter stitch, mostly garter stitch, and just has a nice crescent shape. And as you can probably tell, it is enormous. It's um, like the Yowza Way at Shawl by Susan B. Anderson in that it uses up I mean, this is all I had left of my skein. So uh, it uses it all up, and it has this nice crescent shape, and it really makes this big, nice drape around your neck. Like, you can wear it like a big draped cowl sort of thing, or you can... Um, well, you can wear it around your shoulders. It's actually big enough that I'm not even sure I would... It's, it just kind of barely qualifies as a shawlette anymore, but you could wear it, you know, sort of tied around the back. It's definitely long enough for that. And I'm, I'm a pretty tall and not small <laughs> person, so, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely a nice, sizable shawl, which I know a lot of you really like. I really liked working with this yarn. I, I, actually, back to the pattern. I liked the pattern very much. It was very clear. And, um, and the yarn is lovely to work with. It's, um, in many ways, just kind of a standard superwash merino. But uh, I just, I think what makes Miss Babs stand out is their, uh, their really unusual color sense. I mean, I don't normally go for pink. It's not really my thing. As I may have mentioned a few times, I am not very girly. <laughs> but... This isn't pink. This is pink! <laughs> I love it. It's so punky. It's got black in it, and it's got orange and brown. It's really cool. So yeah, I just, I, I was trying to, there were other colors I picked up first that were kind of more in my wheelhouse, but I thought, you know, I'm going to pick up something that pushes me a little bit, and pink definitely does that, but I really really like this and you know when it's not 85 90 95 degrees outside then I will be wearing this a lot so I actually finished that a while ago and ever since then I have been working on the designs that I need to get knitting on I have a seven pattern collection that is coming out in October and the photo shoot is in early August so I have 
Mm, well, there are seven patterns, but there are about 12, I think, samples that need to be knit. And uh, my mom is making one of them. Thank you, mom. And uh, the big one. <laughs> and I have made five of them. Three of the unmade ones are sweaters. So, yeah. So I will try to find interesting things to show you that are not things that I have knit. <laughs> um, so let me just kind of get into talking about what I'm going to talk about today. Actually, one more thing before I get to that. Uh, Nathan, if you are watching, I am going to have to apologize. I haven't been watching podcasts for about a month now. I'm not caught up on your podcast right now. You may very well have answered me, and you may very well have asked me a question. And uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's It has nothing to do with you. I have had... Uh, I am watching a lot of lynda.com videos during my video watching time, so I haven't, I have fallen way behind on podcasts. So, on to the main topic, knit on through all crises. This is a, as many of you probably know, a famous quote, probably the most famous quote from Elizabeth Zimmerman, the grand doyenne of knitting. I love her. I mean, she really is, she is gone now, but uh, she, will, I think, will always be the most timeless knitting expert ever. She's just wonderful. If you haven't read her books, I, I strongly encourage you to do so. She's got a wonderful sense of humor that, especially if you really appreciate a dry English wit, Elizabeth Zimmerman is for you. Uh, I thought of this quote this week as the title for my podcast because it's just, there, there's just been some uproar here <laughs> in the Green Musselman household. Um, nothing dire. It's just been very preoccupying. Um, the main gist of it is that my husband uh, was told a couple of months ago that he was going to be reduced from a 12-month to a 9-month contract. And his employer made it sound like he was not going to be paid at all this summer and that we were going to have to cover our own health care which given that he his income is the vast majority of our household income at the moment and is also the provider his employer is also the provider of our health care was disturbing to say the least <laughs> recently it has come to light that things are not as dire as uh his dean initially laid out uh we're fine but um I've just been really occupied with thinking about what the heck we were going to do this summer. Uh, it has meant we have made a very different kind of plans for the summer than we normally do. We normally have our kid in summer camp and I continue to work and my husband continues to work. We didn't know if we could afford to do that or not. Um, so we haven't signed him up for anything. Of course now we probably could have, but you know, of course everything's filled up now. Blah, blah, blah. So we've made a bunch of plans to, uh, you know, take inexpensive trips to travel to see family, and I'm going to try to squeeze in as much work as I can while we're doing that. That's going to be interesting. The good news is that that means we have some really interesting summer plans, uh, including in, at the end of May, I will be going to Columbus. I think I've mentioned this already. I'll be going to Columbus for the National Needle Arts Association, which is the big trade show for the industry. And I'm really excited about that because, um, do I have the cards, my cards anywhere nearby? Hold on one second. Okay, sorry about that. So I made cards for my business. Dee -dee -dee. Stitch definition. We wanted to be able to hand these out to, since we kind of work with people in the industry and do services for them, uh, this is this show's kind of a big deal for us, and this is where we're formally trotting out our business. But um, there's me and Anne on the back, and we're just kind of explaining everything that we do. So I got a whole box of, uh, of cards made up for us to be able to hand out. And um, we're doing things like... Uh, having breakfast meetings and being available in the bar at the Hyatt Regency. Um, you know, just kind of setting up meetings with different people. 
over the uh, the course of the event. So I'm really excited about that. I haven't been to TNA in a few years, so it'll be nice to to catch up with people again. Um, in June, my son and I, my parents very sweetly, you know, to kind of help out, invited my son out for a couple of weeks. So I'm going to take him out to their place in Alabama and um, and spend a few days there and then come back by myself. And my son will, co will come a couple of weeks later. So that will be nice. I love my parents. I love them so much. <laughs> They're just the best. Uh, and I wish they looked closer. And then in July, we're going to visit Jack's family, which I'm also very excited about. He has a big family, and most of them, many of them, converge on upstate New York in the summer. So we didn't get to go see them last summer. So we're going to go for that. And that will be very fun for my son because his cousins will be there, and it's the way the place is set up. They're all in the neighborhood, and um, and there aren't any busy streets anywhere nearby, so they can basically just run feral for as long as we're up there, which is very cool. Um, I am also going to Gen Con. Oh my god, are any of you going to Gen Con? <laughs> it's not enough. It's not enough that I'm a yarn dork and I geek out over going to yarn conventions. Now I have to go to a gaming convention, too. I was talking to one of my friends who's in... Okay, first of all, Gen Con is a convention of gamers. I have never been before, and it is in Indianapolis in at the end of July, uh, last few days of July, early August. And it's thousands, I think tens of thousands of people, actually. We just kind of will be taking over downtown Indianapolis. Um, and yes, I realize that Indianapolis is... Well, I hope that Gen Con moves to another city. That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, but anyway, I'm very excited about Gen Con. One of my friends who has gone many times before, who is in my gaming group with me, was like, I am so jealous of you that you get to go to Gen Con for the first time. He's like, and and this guy's you know probably about 15 years younger than me, but I, so he's telling me, I don't know if you know what it's like to go to a convention for the first time with thousands of people who are into the same niche thing that you're into. It's so exciting. And I'm like, oh, I know exactly what that's like. I've been to knitting conventions. <laughs> this is going to be a very different crowd. But uh, I'm really excited. And this is the part that may somewhat interest you, even if you're not a gaming person. Uh, the role-playing game that I play is, and that my son plays, he's also coming with me, is a game based on uh, medieval samurai culture. It is a fictional world, but it is almost exactly like medieval Japan. And um, so I found a website that has historically accurate sewing patterns on it. Um, so they're modern patterns, but they are historically accurately rendered garments. And they actually had uh, 12th century samurai outfits. <laughs> so great. So I'm going to sew, I think, we'll see how this goes. I am going to sew uh, outfits for me and for Liam because, yes, there is live action role playing. Oh, yes. So now you know just how big a geek I really am. <laughs> so we're doing that, and then uh, there's something else. Oh, in, also in early August, I will be going out to Albuquerque for the photo shoot for my collection. So it is a very packed summer, and my son starts middle school at the end of August. So, yeah, there's just been a lot going on. And then in the middle of all of this, my husband went to teach on a another study abroad program, this time for two weeks in Rome. He is getting back today. In fact, I need to leave in an hour to go pick him up. <laughs> and, um, and while he was gone, my son came down with what his doctor feared was appendicitis. So we got to spend a day in the emergency room having a uh, ultrasound wand mashed into his stomach. It turns out he does not have appendicitis. He is perfectly fine. But the upshot of all of this is that I have been completely uninterested in knitting for much of the time since the last time I saw you. And I know that, you know, people sometimes talk about this as like losing your knitting mojo, and I just thought we would kind of 
explore this a little more, the loss of the knitting mojo, because it's weird, right? I mean, one of you, who was this? Let me see if I can find it quickly without being annoying. Um, one of you emailed me, no, I cannot, unfortunately, but one of you had emailed me recently about um, suggesting that I talk about the way that knitting is um, is therapeutic, and I'm I'm so sorry that I did not make notes for myself about who which of you had said this to me, but um, it is a very interesting topic, and you know so one of the things that you often hear about, and here's where I think this is really interesting, is that you often hear that knitting is therapeutic, and that people do it to uh, to center themselves to. Uh, work through a difficult situation to uh, to find peace, and um, and then you often hear people talk about too though that when things get really hard, they don't feel like knitting, and so I just thought it'd be interesting to kind of think about a little bit what's going on there because, um. And I think I've figured out that part of it is that knitting is now work for me as well as a hobby. I, uh, I spend my much of my working time on the computer doing graphic design. And, uh, and then the time that I would normally spend knitting for pleasure, I am often spending knitting for work. And and so it's kind of made it so that knitting is uh, kind of stresses me out a little bit. Like I can't just pick up a ball of yarn and just cast on some mindless hat because I should be working on that sweater I'm supposed to be designing. Um, and a lot of the yarn I have is really supposed to be for design projects. So I don't, I can't really just cast it on for something for me. So so that's part of it. Um, yeah, I just, I wish I didn't feel that way, but I, I think it's not just that though, you know? I think there is, um, I think in a weird way, Ravelry has kind of encouraged some of, like in a weird way, I don't blame Ravelry, but there's this funny way that because there are you can spend so much time looking on Ravelry for the perfect project for the yarn that you have, it can actually be a little bit stultifying. Like, what if this hat is not the best thing to do with this yarn? <laughs> what if there's something better? What if I just, if I just spent another half hour looking, maybe I would find something that would use up all of the yarn and not just half of it, or that would fit me just a little bit better. Um, so there's, it's almost like you're, you know, paralyzed by choice. Um, yeah, I think I just need to make more of an effort to have mindless knitting projects on the needles. Like to just make sure there's something like that available all the time. Uh, but even, even casting on something mindless was stressing me out. Like I couldn't find the right yarn for it. And... Ugh, it's just, <laughs> I think I just needed a, needed a little bit of a break. I have uh, finally gotten back to work on my work knitting, which has, I think, kind of loosened me up a little bit to, to work on some other stuff. Uh, but yeah, I don't, need, I don't even know what I'm going to be knitting next for pleasure, honestly. I need to make more of a commitment to do that, don't I? Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, a technique segment for you for today. Okay. I remembered now what I was going to show you. Um, the... I'm sorry. I am so scatterbrained this week. As you can tell, we are nearing the end of the show. This is going to be a short one this week. I, um, you can find me online at darkmatternits.com and I am Dark Matter Knits on all the social media including Ravelry and Instagram which are the two places you can find me most often 
the technique I wanted to share with you today is something that I'm actually using in the collection that I'm working on. Um, I have just a sliver of a piece that in some ways will give you a little bit of a sneak peek of something I'm working on, but without showing you too much. So this is the bottom of a sweater, and I want this sweater to have a pocket on the front, one of those kangaroo pockets that you can put your hands in from the sides. And I was trying to think of a way because, you know, people just really don't like seaming for the most part. Sometimes seams are necessary and really just ought to be done, but sometimes you don't need them. And if I can avoid having people sew stuff up, then I will. So I was trying to think of a way to have this pocket just kind of get worked in seamlessly with the rest of the front. And I am now completely blanking on where I heard this suggestion. It might have actually been on a podcast. But uh, the basic idea is this, that if you want to put a pocket on something, if you want to cast on some stitches and, um, and you know, have two layers of fabric. So this could even be in an, an interior pocket too, for example. You can do this. You can get to the point on the front where the pocket's going to appear, and then before every stitch on that row, on the row where the bottom of the pocket would be, you do a yarn over before every stitch along the the segment of stitches where the pocket will appear. So this is going to be the bottom part of the pocket. On the previous row, I did a yarn over before every single one of the stitches between these two markers. And then you continue to work around, and when you come back, you then take a second needle of the same size, and you just alternate between slipping the regular stitches, the stitches that you had already been working on for the front. Slip those, each one of those, onto a spare needle that will rest in the front. And then you knit through the back loop each one of those extra yarn overs that you put in. And the reason why you knit it through the back loop is just to make, is to twist that yarn over closed so it doesn't make a hole. So then you've got two layers, right? I've got one layer back here that will be the inside of the pocket, and then I've got this outside layer, which are the regular stitches. The inside layer are the yarn overs. The outside layer are the regular stitches that will form the pocket. So it's really cool because, um, and then when you get up to the top, you just, like once I've made the pocket, then you just work kind of like a three needle bind off. You basically knit each one of these front stitches together with its corresponding back stitch, and it just closes it all back up again, no sewing at all. Very, very cool. So yeah, I really, really like this technique, and I think it would be useful for all kinds of times where you need to um, have two layers of fabric, and um, you don't want to actually sew a pocket on. So that's my technique tip for the week. I will hopefully <laughs> see you in a couple of weeks. I'm just going to tell you now that I've told you something about my summer plans. It's going to be a bit wonky around here. I'm not only traveling a lot, but in the times when I am here, I'm going to be needing to work like a dog. So it's going to be, the summer schedule is going to be a little patchy. I'm just going to warn you about that now. And, you know, they may be a little bit shorter and sweeter. But it is good to talk to you again, and uh, thank you for your patience with my <laughs> somewhat off-the-cuff show this week. I will uh, see you soon.